for more on China's approach to foreign investment, let's bring in CGTN's current affairs commentator, Ina Tanjin. So, Ina, in your view, what would you say are some of the key signals that came out of the two sessions about where China's economy is focused? Well, I think uh, Lee wanted to make it very clear that uh, internally, uh, China will be looking at policies to stimulate uh, their economy. Uh, he's uh, just indicated uh, yesterday that he's looking at more tools, uh, interest rate cuts, um, mostly on the market rates, not the interbank rates that you get in the U.S. But internationally, he's he signaled that it's going to be the market that plays the deciding factor. So currency and things like that are going to be left in that direction. They've also changed and made it clear that they have this kind of bottom-up approach, which is instead of using these broad fiscal uh, measures, which uh, led to some uh, slippage, if I should say, um, what they're doing is they're pushing it in at the bottom, these tax cuts and um, rate, rate uh, income tax uh, relief is really aimed at putting more money in the pockets of these small and medium-sized enterprises and also individuals. And that seems to be the main game plan for keeping uh, China's uh, economy on schedule. And of course, we saw China's sweeping new foreign investment law, essentially streamlining and updating three existing laws and trying to level the playing field for domestic and foreign companies. How significant is this first domestically for Chinese firms? Well, it is significant. I, I think they anticipate that there will be some competition. But, you know, there are a number of areas where uh, Chinese firms have not been competing and foreign firms can come in and do that, especially when it comes to risk lending. Uh, the Chinese have asset lending down. You know, you show me your car, your house, and I'll lend you some money. But uh, you come in and you show them a business plan. No matter how good it is, there's this tendency to say, do you have any assets? So this has been holding back a lot of uh, the Chinese innovation that uh, uh, everyone is depending on to move the economy into this kind of tertiary uh, you know, um, level. So if that's the case, then yes, foreign firms who have that expertise coming into China can be uh, accessories to that. In other areas like automotive, yes, it's going to be a head-to-head -head, uh, competition. But it's looking like more and more that despite the fact that you don't have to have a, a partner in China, that a lot of them are looking at joint ventures simply from the logistics of putting things together. Uh, you might have much more ownership on the foreign side, but there's still this desire to uh, kind of plug into existing networks, especially when it comes to distribution. So by adding this new foreign investment law, in, in addition to other efforts to open up, is this essentially what foreign investors have been waiting for? Well, yes, but I mean, remember this, as Nathan uh, pointed out, this is a framework agreement. Uh, it was kind of uh, rushed a little bit. And the background of this, of course, is the U.S.-China trade uh, tensions and disputes that are ongoing. So right now, people are looking to see how everything is going to work out, especially in terms of enforcement. Uh, it's very good to get rid of the red tape, but you have to see how things are actually implemented. I think it's very clear, though, that the government has said um, this is a new big change in direction, and they intend to see it through. Attracting international investment into China is not just about the U.S., it's about the rest of the world. And China, I think, is very intent on developing new markets, and this is an essential approach to that. Now, we know that barring forced technology transfers is a key issue in the U.S.-China trade tensions, and that's also part of the new foreign investment law. How much do you think this will assure foreign high-tech investors globally, as well as the U.S.? I think this is kind of a canard. I mean, there's always been a lot of talk and, and there's a lot of repetition about this forced technology transfer. But if you look on it, uh, there are very few cases that people then say, oh, but they're, they're afraid of going forward. The fact is, um, foreign companies are very savvy. They took the whole package deal. In most cases, they only transferred secondary technology. Uh, this going forward is important, but more important was the progress that's been made over the last five years in terms of developing these separate technology courts, enforcing the rule of law, more stringent efforts on behalf of the government to crack down on uh, fakes and things like this. So uh, going forward, remember, China is now the largest register of IP. Uh, China has skin in this particular game, and you can count on them to start protecting it. So, Aina, what should lawmakers do to ensure that the openness, transparency, and predictability of the investment environment is reflected pro properly at the local level? 
<laughs> that's, uh, that's the question that uh, everyone is asking. How is this going to translate down? But, you know, in so many uh, different municipalities, there are so many different interpretations, especially when you had three different overlapping uh, departments who were involved in this. Having one and making it very clear that the law is the law, these local officials, um, given the current environment, they do not want to invite any kind of scrutiny. The danger is that they just try to do nothing or as little as possible. And so there's going to have to be a, a lot of push on behalf of the central government to make sure that they're abiding not only by the terms of the law, but also its spirit. All right. Thank you, as always. CGTN's current affairs commentator, Ina Tangent.